Well, hello everyone. My name is Shakila Alvarenga. I am the Director of Public Programs at the Mob Museum. Thank you for joining us. This is our fourth installment of Writing the Mob, Chronicling Organized Crime in the 20th Century. Nick Christophers, the author of Mafia Ties, The Greek Syndicates, will be our main speaker for today's program. So please feel free to ask any questions in the comment section below. And let's get started. I'd like to introduce our moderator for the next hour, our Jeff Schumacher, the Vice President of Programs and Exhibits at the Mob Museum. Hi, Jeff. Thank you, Shakela. appreciate that. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, the latest installment in Writing the Mob. We've had uh, a good run here of, of really great authors and uh, that continues today. Uh, a big welcome to Nick, who has written a book called Mafia Ties, The Greek Syndicates. It's a very self-explanatory title. We're going to be talking about the Greek mob today. And uh, it's going to be very interesting because it's a little bit different topic than you might be uh, familiar with. Uh, the format for this program is that Nick and I will have a conversation about his book. And while we're talking, we encourage viewers to write in questions into the chat section of, the, uh, uh, of this program. And then Nick will address those questions later in the program. Uh, Nick, uh, welcome, and, uh, and thank you for participating. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. So let's uh, let's kick off our conversation by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the writing business. Uh, well, I've always loved writing since I was a kid, and uh, I got inspired after reading a specific book when I was in junior high called The Outsiders by S. E. Hitton which a lot of people are familiar with. And I kind of felt uh, I related to the characters like Pony Boy and Johnny because uh, I was going, I was going through something similar at that time. Uh, I joined, a, I was hanging out with a gang in school and I was bullied a lot and I joined them and I kind of, when I read that book, I saw the connection. I felt like I was so, so like going through what they were going through kind of a thing. And, um, that's then I just started writing about this such specific subject area, you know, gangs and gangsters and stuff like that. And of course, I graduated to, you know, uh, writing about mob guys. But uh, in reality, I knew a lot of, I saw a lot of these guys that used to come to my dad's cafe, like every day. So I began to question it at 12 years old, 13 years old, you're wondering who these guys are. You know, who just come in and do whatever the heck they please, pretty much. So that's kind of like when I started around 12, 13 years old until now. And where where was your dad's cafe? Uh, it was in the Five Towns area, uh, near Kennedy Airport uh, in New York. Um, and, you know, guys like Bosses used to come into my place that lived in the area. Uh, Vic Arena was one of them, who's doing a life bit now. Um John Sosani, Booby, used to call him. He was part of Sonny Black's crew in Brooklyn, uh, part of the Donnie Brasco film. Uh, he used to come in there. I used to hang out with him, take his drive in his Lexus. Um, a lot of other guys that used to come in there. I used to have a bookie come there, this guy Sally, every day. I was like, like I said, 12, 13 years old. I see this guy walk in my cafe, walk all the way to come to my restaurant, go behind the counter, walk all the way to the back. I'm like, where's this guy going? I was thinking to myself, Dad, where's this guy going? He says, don't worry about it. So I didn't worry about it. Eventually, I figured out who he was. He, used to, he was the bookie. He used to come in, bring in the football sheets, take bets for horses. And that's how I got kind of mixed up in that world. It was through him because I used to take the football sheet and make copies of it at the library and then bring it to school, have the kids bet with me. And then eventually I got in trouble when Sally found out. <laughs> Now, uh, you, I, it sounds like you could have possibly gone that route. You could have got involved with some of these guys, but you, you didn't do that. But how did, how did that all play out for you? Well, I, I, I got pinched when I was about 21 for, you know, for assault. Uh, so, you know, after I spent the – I was hanging around a lot of these guys in Brooklyn and Queens, the Greek guys and the Italian guys. Um, yeah, and that one night after I got arrested and I was sitting in the cell, I said to myself, I looked around and said, is this what I really want? And it kind of like, you know, a light bulb came on. I said, you know, I can't, this is not for me. And that's how pretty much that and my father talking to me 
you know, and getting me straight kind of a thing, um, kind of got me not to go down that road. But it, it did give me some insight into becoming a writer about this this material, right? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I was like I said, I've always been writing. That was that's when I was twenty one. I was writing all that time, uh, and I was writing mostly like poetry and short stories and stuff like that. Uh, my first book that I actually wrote that I, I never published, but the first time thing I ever wrote was about when I was about eighteen, and it was like a two hundred page book. And it was mob related. I just never did really anything with it at that time. Because, you know, I didn't really know much about publishing at that time. You know, I did it just for fun. So that's kind of when I really started writing, writing. As I got a little older, knew a little more, saw a little more, you know, going to the gambling den and stuff like that. You know, you pick up things and you start learning how these guys talk, where they act, where they dress. I started dressing like my. Like, it's funny because the scene in Henry Hill when he goes to see his mom and she goes, oh, my God, you look like a gangster. Uh, I started dressing like that. And even my parents, it's funny because my parents was looking at me. He says, my father found $500 loafers in my, in my closet. He said, how the hell did you get those? Oh, I saved up money. He didn't believe me. <laughs> well, good. So let's uh, uh, obviously we, we're focused on the Greek mob today, which is a kind of a. Uh, not as well known as the Italian mob or the Jewish mobsters back in the day, but um, how did how and when did the Greek uh, crime element take root in the United States? How did that all work? Well, it it, it kind of started. It was it, they never really had a, a a hierarchy or a family per se, like the Italians or the Irish did, for example, or the Jewish. Uh, they were just very loose knit. Um, so there was like individuals more than just more than families, you know. Um, and I think the earliest Greek gangster, so to speak, is this guy called Sappho the Greek, who was in he was from Chicago, and he was doing the Al Capone days. But there was not very little Reddit written about him. He's, I, I mentioned him in my book, but there wasn't too much about him. So it really, they really started gaining ground. Um, is the 70s, 80s, is when the the, the um, FBI and the authorities started taking notice um, in New York specifically and Philadelphia and Chicago too. With guys like Gus Alex, you know Chris Pudos, who we know as Chris Petty, uh, guys like that started to really come, lack of a better term, come of age, so to speak. Right, right. And we'll get back to some of those specific names. Uh, as we talk today, but um, so who were who were like the top Greek mob bosses in the U.S.? Uh, I know there was one big family in New York, for example. Oh yeah, there was actually three big guys that I would say, you know, if you want to say like a John Gotti type of thing, sort of. Uh, in New York would be Spiro Valenzas. Uh, in Philly would be would be Steve Budas or or Harry Petros, those two guys. And Chicago Gus Alex. Those were like the guys that really stood out, that had the most power, that were equivalent to the Italians. Let's put it that way. Now let's start with Valencis. And I think you even have some pictures you can show us of, of Polos and, and Valencis and well, yeah, all uh, that. But let's talk about these different groups. Sure. Uh, well, Spiro actually came into power in the late 70s because his boss, Peter Kourakos, Pete the Greek, um, he came from Greece to the America and in, his, in the late 60s, and he started to, you know, start planning his, you know, crime group, per se. And um, after he passed away, Spiro Villadas, who was Peter's chauffeur slash bodyguard, took over. Now, Peter, Cura, uh, Peter Curac was, was connected with the Lucchese family, and Spiro took over, and he became... Um, under this Lucchese flag as well, under um, Christy Tick Fanati. That was his name. He was the captain and boss of the Lucchese family. And Spiro, or the Greeks per se, used to kick up money to him every month to operate. There was no other way the Greeks could have operated without paying a family. So the Lucchese family was the one they worked with. They worked with the Gambinos too, but the Lucchese, it was the key family. 
Uh, so Spiro set up a network at Astoria, Queens, and in Brooklyn and Bay Ridge, where he ran a lot of gambling uh, establishments, which I also visited when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> he used to play a game called Barbut, was the name of the game that he ran. It was a dice game that only the Arabs and the Greeks played. The Italians they didn't know anything about it, so they could never run the, the gambling them because they were totally oblivious to it. Uh, there was one Italian guy actually on a wiretap where he said, we can never take over this game. The Greeks would, would rob us blind, uh, which is probably true. Uh, so he ran a lot of that, those kind of games. He ran horse parlors where guys used to go bet on horses before OTV became, you know, the came out. Um, so I knew he was making like, I don't know, close to $500,000 a week back in those days, which is a lot of yeah. money. Uh, and he's, like I said, he used to kick up a certain percentage back to the little cases every month. At first, he was kicking back to Bobby Amuso, which is Rick Amuso's son. But then when um, Amuso, then when Amuso uh, went to jail, and, uh, no, actually, apologize. Gas Pipe and Amuso were running the family after Chrissy Tick went to jail. And at that point, this other guy came into the picture. His name was Fat Picciotto. Fat Picciotto was the guy Spiro had to pay, give money to every month. It was a different guy who came in at this point. And Spiro hated this guy immensely. And he was, because he was such a wise ass. And he, uh, he was not a good guy. He was a huge con artist. And he's the one who put it, actually Spiro in jail. His testimony is the one who put Spiro in jail for life. This Picciotto. Um, and at that point, the Greeks were very, they were very quiet. That's why a lot of people, like you said, a lot of people don't know too much about them because it was so under the radar. Uh, they didn't make a lot of noise. They weren't about shooting people every day. It wasn't that kind of thing. Hey, did they whack anybody? Yeah, I'm sure they did, you know. Um, but it wasn't, the news or the media didn't give them much exposure because they didn't see them as relevant as I said, the Italians and the Irish at that time period. But later on, it came evident because when John Gotti and Spiro butt heads, that's when Spiro really came into the forefront of the news. Because Spiro, uh, I think it was in the middle 80s, no, sorry, close, yeah, middle 80s, yeah. He opened a gambling den, which was not too far from John Gotti's gambling den, which is a no-no, because you're, you're eating into the guy's business. So Sammy Gravano had a little chat with John Gotti about this whole situation. And John asked him, who is this guy that opened the den right by us? Who is this person? And Sammy explained, oh, that's Spiro. He's the boss of the Greeks. And there's a very famous saying that everybody knows because it's been on TV a hundred times. The little saying that John Gotti says, tell him, me, I'll sever his motherfucking head off if he doesn't move the game. So John Gotti was talking about Spiro. So Sammy had to pass on that little quote to Spiro so he could move the game, which he did. You know, but prior to him moving the game, because he delayed it, because Spiro was, you know, he didn't like to give it to anybody, no matter regardless who they are. And because of his delay in moving the game, Spiro was shot at. And the, the guy who shot at him was, I think it was Dominic LaFaro and a couple of other guys from the Gambino family. They, they didn't kill him, obviously. They shot they shot him, they injured him, him and two of his other bodyguards. Obviously, they got the message across. So the game yeah. then was moved. Uh, you mentioned another another uh, prominent uh, Greek, Polos, is that his name? Uh, Chris Poulos. Yeah. No, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Back East. Oh, Chris Petty. <laughs> No, no, the Boras. Maybe that's what I'm thinking. Oh, I'm sorry, Steve Budas. Yeah, Steve Budas and Harry Petros were the bosses of the Philly mob. They they pitched in. They were they were around since like the 70s, 70s almost into the 90s. Uh, they used to pitch in the beginning. They were kicking up to Angelo Bruno, who was the boss of the Philly mob. And then when Angelo got killed by uh, Anthony Copernigro, the Nicky Scarfo came into the picture. Now, when Nicky Scarfo came into the picture, he was requesting from everybody a higher street tax, you know, to kick up. 
Now the good Harry and Steve, who ran the they ran the PCP trade in South Philly. They ran the whole big the Metamephi and all that stuff. They were big, very big. They had about 30, 40 members, just like Spiro did in New York. Same amount of guys. They dealt in arson, extortion, loan chalking, all those kind of items. Um, but when Nicky Scarfo came into power and he wanted more money, the Greeks basically told him, hey, get the fuck out of here. We're not giving you the money. Well, obviously, Nicky got pissed. And when he got angry, they whacked out both of them. They killed Harry and um, and they stuffed him in his trunk. And Steve Woodhouse just shot him in a restaurant while he was sitting there with Ray Moderano. Ray Mod- Ray, John Ray Moderano worked with uh, Scarfo. And he set up, he's actually was really good friends with Steve Budas. Like they say, it's your friend that sets you up. And, you know, Moderano set Budas up and he got shot at Malik's restaurant. I think it was 1981 in May. And one of the shooters, from what I understand, don't quote me, but what I said is Nicky Scarfo's son, Nicky Jr., was one of the shooters. That's what they said. There's no proof of that yet. <laughs> Did that, was that kind of the end of that, uh, that organization? Yeah, guys, somewhat. Uh, I mean, so some of the guys still operated. Uh, um, this other guy, George George Botsaris, he ran a lot of the drugs also in the area. So, and um, those Athanas- Athanasios uh, from Apulos was another guy. There's a couple of guys that still were part of that, that were part of Budas and Pietro's organization that still kind of operated outside the fringes of the Italian mob. And but they didn't last that long, obviously. I mean, they, they kind of either meshed in with the Italians or the Irish, or they just totally, you know, went off the map. Just like in yeah. New York, too. Same thing. Same idea. They meshed with the other groups, or they just took off. Yeah. So let's uh, let's shift gears and uh, move over to Chicago. There's, there's one very famous Greek mobster in Chicago, a guy named Gus Alex. What, tell, tell us about Gus Alex. Well, Gus is a very unique character. Gus was a very, he was a, a big, he was a very tough guy in Chicago. He actually came up through the Capone days, really, towards the end of the Capone days. And he hooked up with uh, Jake Guziak, um, who was very close with Capone. And also Jake Guziak and um, Murray Humphreys, Hunchback, all those other guys, he, he hooked up with all them, he did a lot of business with them. He actually, his father ran a restaurant out in Chicago, and a lot of the guys used to come to the restaurant. And his father was a gambler himself. So a lot of just sort of like me, kind of a thing. A lot of guys used to come to the restaurant, and Gus would notice them and befriend a few of them. And eventually, there was one guy, I think his name was Frank Russo, that he became very close with. And Frank was a street guy. So one thing led to another, and Gus slowly integrated in with the Italian mob. And what eventually happened is uh, Gus uh, ended up running the what they call the loop in Chicago, meaning he ran the whole political political fixing was his his uh, forte. So any guy gets pinched or got to go to court or needs to be in front of a judge or some lawyer or whatever, Gus would fix it. And he was the fixer for the whole entire mob. Outside of running a lot of gambling dens with other guys like George Bravos and Gus's brother. He also ran around with Gus and took care of some of his gambling operations. So he was very versatile outside of just politics. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting about about the Chicago outfit is how there were so many people involved in the outfit who were not Italian. Uh, who who had different backgrounds, and they really just needed people who could do a good job, right? <laughs> they wanted people who were effective. Exactly. I mean, the, uh, you're right. The outfit was a very different kind of uh, organization because the outfit was they didn't we didn't have to be Italian to be with them. Where in New York it was a little more stricter. It was a different policy, so to speak. Where in Chicago is kind of loose. You know, if you can break this guy's head. Or you can bring me a lot of money, you're in. So you just, as long as you proved yourself to be sufficient and to be able to support the outfit financially or whatever way possible, then you're, you're good to go. 
I think uh, uh, famously Gus Alex, who was asked to call to testify before the McClellan uh, committee back in the late 50s, and he uh, he pleaded the fifth 39 times. <laughs> he didn't he didn't give up anything. No, Gus. A lot of the a lot of the Greek guys were pretty pretty stuck to the so-called omerta, even though they didn't have to, because they weren't made guys. So they didn't have to do that, really. But a lot of them, there's very few times you hear about any of these guys actually flipping. You know, I mean, one I could remember that actually was a pretty big guy in New York. His name was Donald Krankos. He used to call him Tony the Greek. He was, he was responsible for the Pierre heist in 1972 with Bobby Comfort and Sammy Nalo, which they stole, I don't know how many millions. Uh, they, they think they uh, robbed Sophia Loren's uh, hotel room. Uh, so he was a pretty big guy. He used to work under Tony Salerno, Fat Tony in uh, Harlem. But Franco's eventually, he's the only one guy I can think of that flipped. That was a Greek guy that actually flipped and routed out a lot of the guys he even put out a book, no less. Hmm. We, we touched on this a little bit, but uh, which Italian families did... Uh, did the Greeks deal with mostly? Uh, well, in New York, it was the Gambinos and Lucchese and Colombo. I mean, almost everybody, but strictly Gambino and Lucchese. Uh, and in Philadelphia, there was only one the Philly mob, the South Philly guys, Nicky Scarfo, uh, Gussie Alex, the outfit. Um, somebody who we'll speak about later, Chris Petty or Chris Poulos, his proper name. He dealt with Vegas, LA, which is the outfit in uh, Chicago and some of the guys in LA, which is the, the Draga family. So it most strictly the family that was uh, more importantly was again being in Lucchese here in New York. Okay. Was speaking right. family per se. And uh, what were the, the, mo the most important, you, you mentioned this uh, dice game that the Greeks had. Mm -hmm. Can you, do, you, do, you, do you recall how that worked, what, how, that, how that game worked? It's a little complicated. <laughs> uh, yeah, see, there, there's a guy, one guy, it's a long, long table, and there's guys around the table, and they take a, a, a cup with dice, and you gotta, and you gotta think of what he's gonna roll. So he rolls the dice, and then the dice has to come to a certain number, whatever number that's gonna be picked at that time. And if the guy next to you picked the same number, then whatever he bet, he can double or triple his. It's payback, but it all depends. If you, if the guys at the table either want to be part of the role or they don't have to be. It's up to them, and the game can go on for hours. Hmm. Yeah, it's a little complicated because it's. That's why they said before the Italians can never figure it out. <laughs> uh, so most of the people playing this game must have been Greek as well. Yeah, Greeks, uh, Arabs, some Italians, depending. You know, one of the guys who actually ran it with Spiro in New York was Italian. They call him Mike the Italian, Mike Carrillo. So it depends. Some, most of it was actually, uh, it was, yeah, it was Albanian Greeks and, and sometimes Italians, yeah. What, what were some other rackets that uh, Greeks were involved in? Um, extort, uh, loan sharking was very big. Uh, Spiro did it, saw a lot of that because when some guy, some guys go there, and you know, when you bet, let's say you don't have the money, right? What do you need? You need a loan, so you take out a marker. So if you can't pay that marker, and they come looking for you, <laughs> you're gonna get yeah. your, you're gonna get beat, obviously. Uh, in my book, I actually have a uh, excerpt of a guy that got his teeth knocked out, and I have the whole excerpt about him talking to this other guy, this Albanian guy, who's telling him. You got to come in. You got to come in and make the payments. And he's like, "No, I'm too scared to come in. They already, broke, they already put me in the hospital. I have no teeth. They broke my teeth." So <laughs> yeah, they did a little bit of loan sharking. Um, not so much extortion, really, but more, like I said, loan sharking, gambling, murder. Not really, unless it was necessary. Really, really necessary. So that's a that wasn't very common. Um, shaking down businesses. Not really. It was strictly gambling and loan sharking was the real main. Hey, well, in Philadelphia, I'm sorry, in Philly, was a, they did a, they did a, a lot of drug dealing. Um, oh. Yeah, in New York, depending on what family they were connected to, like this one guy John Venizelos, who was really active in Canada, 
was part of the Bonanno family in New York. And he, and he did a lot of drug trafficking between New York and Canada. So they, depending on who the individual is and what part of your family they're part of, pretty dictates what, they, what they're involved in. Sure. So uh, I'm real interested about uh, in, uh, you know, sort of the Greek mafia in Greece, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, wh where do they operate outside the U.S., Greece and other places? But and uh, weren't they pretty entrenched like in Athens or maybe they still are? Yeah, they were, they were for a long time um, in Athens, in Mani, um, a little bit in Crete, but Athens specifically, like you said. Um, guys like John Vla uh, John Vlatos was a big guy. Uh, Vasily or Billy Stefanakos was another big guy. Um, Yanni Tsakoyanis. All these guys were involved in everything and anything you can imagine between uh, gun running, drugs, uh, trafficking, um, extortion, loan change, you name it, gambling, anything you can think of under the sun. They did everything, they did it all. Uh, until 2011, 2010, 2011, the uh, authorities, what is called a mafia crackdown, they started cracking down on every single family, every single person you can think of. Uh, the Grigorakos family is another big family that ran a lot of operations in Athens. Uh, the problem, and these guys didn't really, they worked with each other. It wasn't like the Italians, really, that they kind of worked in separate families. Uh, over there, they worked with everybody. Like one guy from the Grigorakos family could work with the Zakoyanis family. It doesn't matter. They could do it. As long as money gets funneled where it's supposed to go, they're free, they're free to operate openly. Uh, the only problem was is when they entrenched in somebody else's territory, like a, a brothel or a strip club, uh, where they would bomb them. If one guy was trying to take the other guy's area or he moved in, he wasn't supposed to, they would plant a bomb in the place. People in it or not, it didn't, didn't matter. They just, this were, that was a big thing, using bombs. But I, and I, I think if I understand this correctly, the, the, the Greek mafia in, in Greece, especially in Athens, uh, really runs the nightclub business there too. That's correct. That actually, in Greece, they have a name for these guys. Like we have wise guys here in New York and yeah. in America. They call them, uh, in Greek, it's, it's called Nunot Disnictas, which means Godfathers of the Night. So, because like you just said, they ran all the nightclubs. Every nightclub you imagine, cabaret, strip clubs, they ran, they run every single one of them. So that's why they call them by that name because they operate during the evening. And Godfather, as we know, Godfather, that's kind of yeah, obvious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, are they still active today? Is that is it still going on? Yeah, to some degree, not to the what they were before. Because too many of them have been incarcerated or died, you know. Uh, Stefanakos died about two. Was actually Stefanakos was killed about two three years ago. He was shot outside of a cafe. Um, Angelopoulos, which was uh, he was considered the Pablo Escobar of Greece, because he ran all the cocaine trade. Uh, he's actually out of prison, and he's somewhere in Greece. I know how to talk. I know how to get in contact with him, but I'm not going to tell anybody. But nonetheless. <laughs> Uh, but they, they don't, they're not as structured or as unified as they once were. The, the, the authorities did a really good job. They put a lot of them away. Uh, but they still operate. Uh, as a matter of fact, about three weeks ago, I think it was about three weeks ago, they shot him, they killed a journalist outside of his house in Greece yeah. about three weeks ago. And they, as far as the authorities are concerned, it's, they believe it's mob related because this guy used to write about articles on that subject so which has never happened before they never normally don't kill journalists or politicians they kidnap them for ransom that they did a lot <laughs> kill them right. not really so this was a very out of the ordinary event and i mean one of the not that we don't have the same problem here but for a long time the greek government was pretty corrupt or easily corrupted right because that's one reason they were able to operate well yeah i mean the we had, well, the, we, yeah, we had the Greek, uh, the Greek government, yeah, just like any other place, they are pretty corrupt. It's, it's a fact. I mean, Greece almost went into 
uh, major debt a couple of years ago, a couple of uh, was five, six, ten years ago, whatever it was, and they were almost the country was about to collapse because of the corruption going on in politics. So yeah, I mean, you know, when, just like here, you know, if if the if the wise guys know that the politicians are corrupt and they don't really care, yeah, we can do whatever we want, which is which is which was the case during the Kennedy election. That's how Kennedy became president. Because John Sam Giancano, Carlo Marcello, all those guys made it what made it happen. So uh, it's similar theory, yes. It's now I think it's gotten better than it's been in the past. Yeah, pretty good. Well let's we've touched on him a couple of times. Well, let's come back to uh, Chris Petty. That's how he's known out here. Uh, but talk a little bit about him and his involvement with originally from Chicago. Uh, but got and got involved with the outfit, but then probably better known in California and Las Vegas. Can you talk about Chris Petty? Yeah, well, Chris Poulos was uh, actually Chris Petty, uh, but we, his real name is Chris Poulos. Um, he was involved in a lot of uh, interesting rackets. He wasn't really a, a shooter or of that nature. He was more of an earner. He knew how to make money, you know, and he dealt with guys like in Chicago, he dealt with guys like uh, Gus Alex at a certain sometimes. Then at other times, he was with uh, I think Murray Humphreys, uh, Joe Weeper, and all them. And then and Tony Spilotro, he was close with Tony the Ant, who we know was very big in Vegas. Um, also, Frank Bombasiero, which was in California. Chris Poulos did business with him. Uh, he tried at one time, I believe, to uh, infiltrate a uh, Indian tribe uh, mm -hmm. establishment, which is the Rincon tribe, I think it was called, and yep. he was trying to, you know, embezzle money from the place, along with the guy who ran the uh, yep. the reservation, the chief. I can't remember his yep. name right now, but he tried to do that, and it kind of worked, but they, I believe he got caught. Um, I don't remember if he actually did some time. I don't think he did. I think he got away with it, from what I understand. There was some other case where he got um, arrested when uh, a gentleman tried to advance on his girlfriend, and he hit him with a bat. These two young guys at his apartment. and But he was defending himself, but the other guy had a gun. But that didn't really matter in court. And I think he got... Uh, that one, one to two, three years, I think, believe for that case. Let me. Uh, I have to. Let me help uh, clarify that one a little bit. I, I talked to Oscar Goodman, the mayor, for, former mayor of Las That's Vegas, right. he was former That's right. defense attorney for the mob, who is here in Vegas, and he's affiliated with our museum. And and Oscar, I was talking to him yesterday about this, and he told me that uh, uh, that Chris was involved with a girl at that time, a woman. And and that she what they were she was living in this condominium complex, and they were there. And uh, these these guys nearby were making a lot of noise, and and they were just causing a lot of ruckus late at night. So they uh, uh, Chris confronted them, and and he had a baseball bat with him. Uh, had an altercation. The one guy had a gun, and so Chris hit one of the guys over the head with the baseball bat. Right. That's so right. Uh, uh, there was a trial. Uh, Oscar thought the trial should have lasted about five minutes, but it lasted three weeks. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, the jury came back and found Chris guilty of hitting, uh, but here's what they did. The jury made a big mistake. The jury convicted him of hitting the guy that he didn't hit. In other words, he was <laughs> declared he was declared not guilty or innocent of hitting the guy he did hit, and he was declared guilty of hitting the guy he didn't hit. So uh so what happened is oscar moved to for a not guilty verdict based on this faulty judgment on the part of the jury they just got it wrong they didn't know remember the facts of the case and the judge agreed and he walked away uh without any penalty at all um so uh that sort of what according to oscar that's how it played out is the jury made a big mistake he would have been he was convicted but then it was thrown out by the judge and uh, and then uh, uh, <laughs> so it, these these cases are always so fascinating when you get into the details. Sure, know? that is interesting. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, he, he told me something else about Chris Petty I thought was interesting, too. You know, that case at Rincon Indian Casino that you referenced, you were talking about how they were trying to infiltrate this casino, this Indian right. casino. One of the other defendants in that case uh, was a Chicago outfit guy named John, John DeFranzo. Yeah, DeFranzo. No, no, no Nose was his No uh, Nose, that's right. And Oscar spent, Oscar, the lawyer, spent a lot of time with these guys during this trial, right? They're all like you know, talking in between, uh, you know, the, the, the trial and at night and so forth. And he was talking about DeFranzo would cook dinner for them. And he cooked like the best meatballs that Oscar <laughs> had ever eaten. They were like the, the best you could ever get. And so Oscar got the recipe uh, from him. And I guess to this day, they still make these John DeFranzo meatballs. That John DeFranzo meatballs, that's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> so what else, uh, Nick, what else can you tell us about the, uh, the Greek mob? Like, you know, what are some of the maybe interesting stories you came across as you were working on the book? Uh, well, I mean, there was one guy that uh, I thought was pretty interesting. His name is Will Liakakos, but Will people know him as William Lias, L-I-A-S. Uh, he's he's, he's in, uh, from the Ohio area, and he ran, he was a very smart guy. He was more of a businessman, but he got mixed into the rackets as well. And he's from the, like the early, late uh, 20s, early 30s around that time period and he did it he was very much involved in gambling and he used to open a lot of different like uh racetracks in ohio he opened a couple of different businesses and he got busted a couple of times because they thought he was skimming profits from whatever business he was opening and they made him close one place after another and he would just open another one after one after he was just always he was always one step ahead of them uh the authorities i'm talking about he was a big, very big heavy set guy about 300 some pounds you know uh he never did anything really violent except he had one guy that was always i forgot his name right now and that was always that I tried to uh rat him out about something because he got offended so we like we like we out to some guys in the ohio area and had him taken out. They never proved that Will Lies was involved with this murder. Um, then later on, Will, he passed away in the I think around the 60s, but he ran a lot of big businesses in Ohio. Uh, like I said, racetracks, restaurants, um, some gambling dens. I mean, not that they were very known for that, but he did that on the side to generate income so he can open a lot of these places. Uh, he was a great businessman. This guy could have been a CEO of a company if he wanted to. But he always tried to do everything a little bit shady. So he was a pretty interesting character, I would think. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's a lot more in this book that we haven't touched on. And so I, I definitely encourage people to, to pick it up because, it, it you know, it's, when, you, when you read about the mob and you study uh, this, uh, this topic, uh, you 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 run across these Greek names once in a while, right? As you're in passing, but this is a book where you actually get to learn about all of them in greater detail. So I think it's a great service that you've done to put this book together. Um, I'm just curious, uh, uh, Nick, what, are you working on something uh, new? Um, well, I mean, I was actually there's somebody I didn't mention earlier. Uh, since you talked, since you're asking that question, this guy, his name is Bill Cotolo. Bill Cotolo, who you met that time when we met, uh, yeah. his father was Wild Bill, Wild Bill Cotolo here in New York. Wild Billy, actually, and his father did business with Spiro here in New York. Uh, they did some business with uh, gambling. And uh, there was one guy that, uh, Wild, that his father had to have a talk with that was impeding on Spiro's business. And Wild Bill went to visit this particular person. And he told him, if you don't do what you're supposed to do and lay off this guy's prop, uh, gambling area, the next thing, I'm, ne next thing you're going to be getting is flowers. Meaning, he's going to be raising up daisies, basically. Uh, so Bill Cotolo had a lot of bills, junior and senior, did some business with the Greeks, along with another friend of Billy's, who's also a friend of mine, 
uh, Andrew Di Donato. Andrew Di Donato was uh, an associate to Nikki Carozzo and the Gambino family. And when when Spiro went away to prison, there's a lot of shifting going on in Queens because the Albanians were trying to come in by force. And there was uh, an incident at a soccer club where these Albanians came in and told the Greeks, we're taking over now. In other words, they're taking their step in on the Italian's toes. So they came in. The guy who used to rent the Albanians back then was Alex Rudai. He was the head of the Albanians in Bolton, the Bronx. And he came down there. These guys came to the soccer club and with AK-47s. And they told him, listen, we're taking over. Some of the Greek guys pulled out guns, but what's little pistols are going to do to AK-47s? So the, 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 the Greeks said, okay, they put their guns down and didn't do a thing. Word got out that this happened. And the Gambinos and the OKs said, we got to do something. So they, Andrew Di Donato was asked to go and he was supposed to hold the door to, to keep watch out of all the gambling dens. In other words, protect the door that nobody gets in and out. And that was another interesting incident that happened when Spiro went away that the Gambinos and the Cases were trying to, you know, they were trying to hold on to their. You know their money train. You know before the Albanians told before the Albanians really did actually totally come in. You know, it's uh, you mentioned the Albanians a number of times, and I don't think we've ever done a program at the museum about the Albanian mob, but that's a fairly big deal in New York, right? Uh, yeah, it was actually back in the uh, '90s. Um, uh, Alex Ruda used to run the Albanian crew. They were a bunch of crazy guys. They were very wild. Uh, very very violent, violent, right? All about that. Very violent. Those guys. That that was kind of like the downfall. See, with the Italians and the Greeks, they specifically Italians and Greeks, they were they were, they tried to stay a little bit low key. They didn't like whack people all the time. The Albanians didn't care. They took everybody out. It's irrelevant. Just like sort of like the Russians. But yeah. I mean, there's an interesting story I could tell you, where uh, Arnold Scuteri who was one of the captains of the Gambino family, set up a meeting with the Albanians about the fact that they were trying to take over Italian areas, like Astoria, where Spiro was. So they had a meeting at a gas station. About, I don't know, 10, about 30 Italians showed up from the Gambino family with Alex Rudai, about 10 Albanians. So they're at a gas station, and Arnold Scuteri is talking to Alex Rudai, who was the boss of the Albanians. So he takes a he takes out a machine gun, Rudai, and he points it at the gas tank, and he tells uh, Scuteri, either you let us do what we need to do, or we all go up and smoke. Scuteri said okay, and he backed off. <laughs> Just to show you how crazy these guys were, they were willing to all like, they were willing to all kill each other, just so they can get where they want. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a true story. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Well, Nick, uh, uh, thank you very much for, uh, what well, we do have, let me ask you, there is one more question. We had a question from the, uh, from one of our viewers. And I think we touched on this a little bit, but uh, you could, you could elaborate. Uh, it, this viewers asks, what does the Greek mafia look like in the present day? I don't think there is one. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're not, they're not, uh, they're, there's probably small Greek criminals, you know, working, working with the Italians, yeah. uh, like Chris Fosarakis, he's one of them. Um, there's a few, but they're not, they don't have that tight knit family like they did in Philly and in New York back in the day. A lot of things have changed. A lot of those guys actually either escaped to Canada or they went back to Greece and just got involved with the Greek crews in those areas. Because in Canada, with the Rizzuto family, there, well, he's not there around, I and mean, he's, he's dead. But a lot of that clan, a lot of them have, um, got involved with that organization up there in Canada and back in Greece. Absolutely, very good. Well, uh, uh, again, thank you for doing this. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to uh, to. Well, I think we have a link to buy the book uh, available to people watching, and uh, want to thank you for taking the time today to talk to us. Well, I appreciate it. I thank you very much. Uh, but I also would like to add that the book is going to be republished by Coastal West Publishing, uh, a Canadian Canadian publisher, uh, probably sometime in July. 
I mean, the book is available now, like you said, uh, Jeff, but it will be uh, under a different publisher starting in, I think, around July, August, around that time. And I know Coastal West has, has been publishing a number of uh, mob-related books lately, and they do a really nice job. So I, I, I'm sure it will be a real nice addition. Yes, I'm excited about that. Very good. Well, thanks a lot, Nick, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. No, thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and we'll catch you at the next Writing the Mob.